welcome to Phillips Theological Seminary and this morning's chapel service in observance of Women's History Month. So many women have influenced and continue to influence the society in which we live. Today we lift up names, knowing that the full number could never be reached, knowing that for every name we know and every story we remember, there are countless women whose names and stories, at least so far, have been lost to history. Let these names, past and present, wash over you like a waterfall. We celebrate activists such as Sylvia Rivera and Marsha P. Johnson, Angela Davis, Audrey Lord, Grace Lee Boggs, Patrice Coulors, Alicia Garza, and Opal Tometi. We celebrate authors such as Helen Zia, Alice Walker, Bell Hooks, and Octavia Butler. We celebrate artists and designers such as Frida Kahlo, Anita Fields, and Maya Lin. We celebrate scientists such as Anna Roque de Dupree, Katherine Johnson, Ellen Ochoa, and Dr. Nita Patel. We celebrate government leaders such as Queen Lilio Kalani, Representative Patsy Takamoto Mink, Representative Shirley Chisholm, Principal Chief Wilma Mankiller, Associate Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and Vice President Kamala Harris. We celebrate poets such as Phyllis Wheatley, Maya Angelou, Joy Harjo, and Amanda Gorman. And especially today, in this seminary worship service, we focus our celebration on women in ministry. Hey everyone, thank you for joining us for chapel this morning. Phillips Theological Seminary welcomes all persons, regardless of sexual orientation or gender identity. In honor of Women's History Month, today's service is designed to specifically highlight female contributions to the sacred work of ministry. We celebrate women in ministry, lay and ordained, women such as... First lay preacher Darina Lee of the African American Episcopal Church, first ordained deacon Julia Foote, and first ordained elder Mary J. Small in the AME Zion Church, as well as first bishop Teresa Jefferson Snorton of the CME Church. First ordained elder Lois V. Glory Neal and current district superintendent Sharon Yaikuo of the United Methodist Oklahoma Indian Missionary Conference ordained Baptist trans pastors, Junia Joplin and Allison Robinson, as well as Reverend Tori Jamison, founding pastor of Lot's Wife Trans and Queer Chaplaincy. First ordained Anglican priest, Reverend Dr. Florence Lee Tim Oy, Puerto Rico's first clergywoman of any denomination, Julia Torres Fernandez, and current executive minister of justice and witness ministries, Reverend Tracy Blackman of the United Church of Christ. Bishop Leontine Kelly, Bishop Minerva Carcano, and Bishop Karen Oliveto of the United Methodist Church, as well as General Minister and President of the Christian Church Disciples of Christ, Teresa Horde Owens. These and so many more women have broken and continue to break silences imposed by church and community. I hope your mind is flooded right now with names and faces. You will have the opportunity to share these names in the chat during our common prayer time. This morning, Phillips welcomes to the pulpit Reverend Heather Shearer, ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, associate pastor of Faith UMC in Tulsa, and founding pastor of Living Water UMC in Glenpool, Oklahoma. In fact, she is the Oklahoma Conference of the United Methodists' first female church planter. After 20 years in youth ministry, Reverend Shearer graduated with an MDiv from Phillips in 2013 and has been serving faithfully ever since. She loves to hike where she feels connected to the holy. She has three adult children and is expecting her first grandchild on the 21st of the month. Reverend Shearer, Heather, your seminary community welcomes you to preach a good word this morning, disobedient woman as we center our hearts and minds for worship. When we say women in ministry, it 
often begins a debate. Those on the left side of the room get mad at men, and those on the right, uh, they might even become irate. But somewhere in the middle are voices often ignored because they are less taken by gender roles and stand in awe of the woman who gave them wings to soar. So imagine with me that we usher the left and the right side of the rooms into a soundproof room. The only whispers now cutting the silence would sound a lot like, thank you. Thank you to my mother who walked in her anointing from God. Thank you to my father who nurtured her like seeds planted in rich sod. Thank you to my pastor. She walked with me through my grief. And when I had no money, she helped me find economic relief. Thank you to the preacher. Her sermon brought me to the cross. Thank you to the missionary. Because of her, I am found instead of lost. Thank you to the soundboard woman. I can hear the sounds so clearly. And hats off to the women who usher and every Sunday greet me. Thank you to my youth leader. She cares about my generation. She knows how to break down the gospel and meet me at PlayStation. <laughs> Thank you to that Christian. She helped me buy a home. Who knew that faith and realty didn't stand alone? Thank you to the chaplain. She was present when I was at my worst, at the hospital, in the military, or even in professional sports. The thank yous kept on ringing, for in seconds the room went from anger to silence to singing. The praises of the women who walk in their call, no matter their gender, their heart is to give their all. It's shame that the church holds on to ceilings of glass when God created this world for men and women free of social class. A garden, some fruit, a couple of rivers, and a call to care for the earth and every living creature, yes, even the ones that make your skin crawl. It was never about social gender roles and progress. That's can be in ministry. The thank yous exist because she exists fully in who God created her to be. So to all the mothers, sisters, aunties, and daughters, to those who have gone before, those present, and those who are to come after, we celebrate you and your ministry as you continue to stand in truth. And we don't say it often enough, but today, today please accept our resounding thank you. i 
and welcome to this time of prayer in our worship service. My name is Reverend Dolores Williamston. I am a D-Men student at Phillips. Let us prepare our hearts and souls and minds this morning as we lift up the names of women from the past, present, and those women yet to come in the future. I invite you to journey through this prayer litany with me. There will be moments of pause and a time for you to list in the chat the names of those women who come to your hearts and minds today. After the pause, join me where you are with these words, God in your mercy, hear our prayer. So let us begin in an attitude Let us name those women who went before us, blazing and praying and pushing and shoving as faith communities tried to quench silence or diminish their voices. Name their names. Sojourner Truth. Amanda Berry. Ida B. Wells, Zephra Heiston, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us name those women who stand before us now, preaching and proclaiming and reaching and naming as we listen and receive and embrace their wisdom. Name their names. Bishop Cynthia Ferrero Harvey, Bishop Tracy Malone, Reverend Portia Cavett, Reverend Cynthia Smart, Henrietta Heiston. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us lift up names of women to come. For those who will come prophesying and leading and creating and innovating, as long anticipation and hope for the Holy Spirit to do a new thing in them, Name their names as we long for them. Jazara, 
Etta, Abigail, Emily, Carly, Janara, God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Will you be in an attitude of prayer with me? Spirit of renewal, God of many names and God of transforming and abundant love, we turn this month to reflect on the stories and the heritage and the struggles of women throughout the ages. We seek to learn from all those voices that have been left unheard. May we pause before the silences of the ages and find who has been left out and craft a new way of inclusion every day, every week, every month, and every year. May this spiritual practice bring out the voices of all those struggling all of those who are left out. Help us, God, to let go of our assumptions and cold comforts of what is the normal to live by. Help us, O oh God, to live by a standard that is rooted in your compassion. Help us, O oh God, to live by a standard that is rooted in inclusivity and rooted in diversity. May this month, O oh Lord, be a reflection to teach us to search for those stories that are different from our own, stories that are unique, stories that are yet unheard, stories that are yet unsung. Mothering God of all possibilities, in the reshaping of our hearts and minds today, may we come to know ourselves changed, renewed where we are dry, hopeful where we are lost, and open to where we are shut. Amen and amen.
Hear these words from Numbers chapter 12, verses 1 through 16. While they were at Hazaroth, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman he had married, for indeed he had married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has the Lord not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now the man Moses was very humble, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. Suddenly the Lord said to Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, Come out, you three, to the tent of meeting. So the three came out. Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the entrance of the tent and called Aaron and Miriam, and they both came forward. Hear my words. When there are prophets among you, I, the Lord, make myself known to them in visions. I speak to them in dreams. Not so with my servant Moses. He is entrusted with all of my house. With him I speak face to face, clearly not in riddles, and he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant Moses? And the anger of the Lord was kindled against them, and the Lord departed. When the cloud went away from over the tent, Miriam became leprous, as white as snow, and Aaron turned toward Miriam and saw she was leprous. Then Aaron said to Moses, O oh my Lord, do not punish us for a sin we have so foolishly committed. Do not let her be like one stillborn, whose flesh is half consumed when it comes out of its mother's womb. And Moses cried to the Lord, O oh God, please heal her. But the Lord said to Moses, If her father had spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her be shut out of the camp for seven days, and after that she may be brought in again. So Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam had been brought in. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Stacy, for inviting me to preach for my alma mater, Phillips Seminary, today in honor of Women's History Month. I appreciate uh, being extended this opportunity. Today, I want to talk about the prophet Miriam. I want you to consider her as a prophet as we are told in Exodus 15:20 that at the Exodus even though Moses has a very long song that Miriam is the only other person that sings and she sings it's only two verses in the Bible but she has a tambourine and then all the women of the community that have been part of this incredible event dance with her in this celebration at the Exodus. And so that is when we hear in the Bible that she is named prophet. But before we know her as prophet, most likely most of us know her as the unnamed sister of Moses. The story that we are probably most familiar about is the one where her mother places the baby in the reed basket and then puts it in the water. We are told that his sister stands and keeps watch. But then when the princess finds the baby, it's Miriam, the sister, who on her own comes up with this wonderful idea that she will find the wet nurse to take care of the baby. And so Moses gets to go back to his mother because of Miriam's quick thinking as she reacts in a way to provide for her brother. Now, I myself am a big sister, and even though my brother is only one year younger than myself, he used to say that it was like growing up with two mothers because I was always bossing him around and tattling on him when he did something he wasn't supposed to. So I totally understand Miriam's desire to protect this younger brother. And so even though she is tasked, or um, it doesn't say anyone tells her to, but that she decides to watch 
this baby that they've hidden so well in the water. She takes upon herself to provide care and protection for him, even though her name is never mentioned in that story. You see, one of the things that I never noticed about the scriptures before I went to seminary was who has a name and who has a voice. These are things that I learned in my very first semester at Phillips. I had Professor Rick Lowry as my Testament, and he was supposed to teach us the entire Old Testament, but he loved the book of Genesis so much that we spent the whole semester in Genesis, ex except for the last couple weeks, where we squeezed in everything else. But I love that class so much. The things that he taught me and the way to read the scriptures. Um, I was so excited that every time I went home after being in class all day Thursday, I would sit my family down and my mother would come over and then I would teach them everything I had learned that day while I was at school. And so this text that we have for today is significant in several ways and I want us to consider that. For this month of Women in History, I, I want to point out some things about Miriam. One, we already know she has a voice. Two, we already know that she eventually is named. And three, I've already said that she is called a prophet in the text. Just for fun, I thought it would be interesting to see how many times she is named in the Bible. Thirteen times. But then I decided to look at how many times Aaron and Moses, her baby brothers, how many times they are mentioned. And so, of course, Moses being the favorite is mentioned 797 times in the Protestant Bible. It's interesting, when I took my Judaism class in seminary and we did the um, celebrations of the Exodus, I thought it was fascinating that they never mentioned Moses at all. You see, as they remember, they remember that it was God that did all of those miracles, not Moses or Aaron. And then Aaron is mentioned in the Bible by name 339 times. And so even though Miriam is only mentioned 13 times, we know as a woman she is not equal, even if we didn't have those numbers. As the, even though she's the oldest child in that world, and I would argue even in our world today, in some ways she is considered less than. In the title in the NRSV for this chapter 12, it talks about how Miriam and Aaron are jealous of Moses. But I hope that you will see that this chapter that we're doing today, Numbers chapter 12, is really about God saying to everyone, Moses is my favorite. That should be the title for this chapter. I want to make sure that you notice that in this particular chapter of Numbers, that Miriam has no voice except for the one sentence where she and Aaron speak together. God and the narrator of the story do most of the talking. Also, in the rest of Numbers, her name is always listed in the order of her status, which is last. But for some reason, in this particular chapter of Numbers, her name comes first as she and Aaron complain about Moses marrying outside their ethnic identity. I think that the author is hinting that she is the most at fault for the complaining by putting her name first. Now, I don't know about you, but that makes me think about the Garden of Eden, where we know that both Adam and Eve ate of the garden, but history and the Bible and all of the ways we reflect on that story always say that Eve is the most guilty. It's sort of the biblical way, but I digress. Let's get back to Numbers chapter 12. The author offers us this juicy little tidbit of gossip about Moses as the reason for the rest of the chapter. I want to remind you, 
While they were at Hazareth, Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married. For he had indeed married a Cushite woman. And they said, Has the Lord spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us also? And the Lord heard it. Now this repetition of the complaint is an emphasis, so we make sure we know what they are upset about. They have also been spoken to by the Lord, and they may see themselves as equal, if not greater, than their baby brother. Seems like normal family dynamics of jealousy that would happen. Now, the man Moses was very humble, we hear in verse 3 from the author and narrator, more so than anyone else on the face of the earth. This is quite a statement. We clearly see that the narrator and author wants us to know that Aaron and Miriam should never have criticized their baby brother. We also hear from God very clearly that there is no barrier between God and Moses. We get this beautiful language of face to face and in some translations, mouth to mouth, that the intimacy that is displayed in this language shows that there is no one else that is that close to God. It's also interesting to us that Aaron isn't punished. You have to wonder, is is he not punished because he jumps in and asks for forgiveness? Or is he not punished simply because he is a man? I have to be honest with you. I think he's not punished because he is a man. That Miriam is the one who takes the full brunt of guilt for what has happened with Aaron and Miriam. And then, of course, Aaron, he immediately backpedals into his brother, and he starts referring to him as my lord. So he's clearly moved himself down in the level of importance as he begs Moses to fix this leprosy that has covered Miriam. And the Lord's reaction in the very one sentence that Moses actually says, which is to help his sister, the Lord responds with this sort of weird conversation about even someone who has been spit upon by their father would be expected to be punished for seven days. We find examples of this in Deuteronomy and Job and Isaiah. And so the expected time in this sort of standard practice of shaming of a father spitting on a child is seven days. And so I want us to look just for a moment on verse 15 closely. So Miriam was shut out of the camp for seven days, and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam had been brought in again. After that, the people set out. As a woman in ministry, I find a lot of comfort in this verse. Maybe Miriam was disobedient and out of line, and maybe her complaints were even a little selfish and petty, but she still held influence in the community. One of my very favorite quotes is from Eleanor Roosevelt, and it says, women who behave never make history. Now, you might ask if I just am disobedient, and that's why I like this text. But I also think it's important for us to recognize that women who step outside the roles that are assigned to them are often the ones who call us to something more. And without those disobedient women, those ones who don't behave, that we may never be called into what is possible and what is next for women. Miriam like us, is not perfect. She is clearly not behaving. This same strength of character that makes her complain and be disobedient, though, is also what makes her brave enough to step out of the reeds and talk to the princess and save her brother's life. This strength and disobedience is what motivates the midwives, Shipra and Pura, when they are told to kill all the Hebrew babies at birth. 
This strength and moral compass is what helps Moses' his mother hide him for three months and eventually put him in the basket with hopes that she can save his life. So Marion was shut out of the camp for seven days and the people did not set out on the march until Miriam had been brought in again. After that, the people set out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Yes, Miriam was punished when Aaron wasn't. Yes, she was out of line when she complained about her baby brother. And yes, she clearly made some mistakes along the way. But I want to end making sure that you understand that even when Miriam's role is diminished beside her brothers, as a woman, she still held a considerable amount of influence in the community. Even God punishing her and casting her out of the community does not move the people because they will not leave without her. This solidarity is rare, and Miriam the prophet teaches us that even when we do not get recognized, or a male takes credit for our work, or we are diminished in the work that we do and the ministry we do for God by other people, that what we do and say and the way we behave still matters. It holds power. And I invite those of you who are women in the ministry not to let someone else take that away from you, to hold on, to be disobedient when it feels like that's what is needed, to hold your head up and be influential with those who will listen, to allow yourself to be used by God, and maybe, maybe you will never be, quote, successful in the standards of this world. But what you do, your ministry is significant. Do not give that away. Do not let external trials steal your enthusiasm for God and what God calls you to. I want you to continue the good fight on this month as we look at the women over history who've been disobedient, those who have not uh, even had their name or their voice recorded in history. Those who have blazed a trail before you and have been disobedient and strong and courageous and influential. You also can be one of those women. Amen.
Now, may God's gifts and mercies be lavished upon us with abundance. These gifts and mercies have been taken up by many faithful people. And this day, we celebrate the faithful women who have used their gifts and shared God's mercies with us. May we, inspired by God's grace, and the faithful women in our lives go forth from this place or wherever you are, ready to serve, ready to listen, ready to answer God's call, and ready to get in trouble, good trouble, necessary trouble, in times such as these. Go with God. Go in peace. Amen. Amen and amen.